Um, just a quick word of, of introduction. My name is uh, Tiki Pang. Um, I'm at the National University of Singapore, but previous to that, I was uh, at the World Health Organization in, in Geneva. Um, you may remember that in 2001, uh, the first draft of the human genome was, was published. And in 2002, the, the WHO published a report on genomics and, and world health. Um, and then a few, many years after that, we, we looked at it and said, what has happened since uh, 2002? Uh, uh, and just to mention that the report was not so much focused on the science of genomics, but on its potential impact and applications in improving health, especially in developing countries. So back in 2009, uh, we, we decided to, to follow up that work by trying to do a global consultation on, on identifying what might be some, some of the grand challenges in, in applying genomics uh, uh, for public health improvement in the context of developing countries sort of 10 years down the road. So this is what it's all about. Um, um, let me just get straight into it. Uh, a lot of this work was, was uh, actually done by, by Mikkel Ustergaard, who worked with me while I was at, at WHO. Uh, it's, it uh, presents a tremendous effort to, to try and, 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 and put in place a process that would you know, try to systematically identify these challenges. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Mikkel to basically present to you what, what were the findings of this exercise. Please. Just press here. Okay. okay, I think it's better now. You can hear me? Okay, um, so firstly, uh, maybe just to point out, so I'm not going to sort of talk through each grand challenge by itself, uh, one by one. Um, so instead, I'm going to sort of create a bit of a platform to and present you a bit of the context, some of our methods and some of the results. So in front of you, on your seat, you should have like a, a printout of uh, the 25 challenges. So uh, you can browse them as, as I talk and hopefully it will make sense to you. Um, So I sh should say that I'm currently working in the biotech um, in the company Rush, but all the work uh, for this exercise I did while I was in WHO, as Tiki mentioned. So I'm standing here on behalf of a very long list of people. Um, so this is the list of people who has been very heavily involved. Um, several of the people are in the room. It's Tiki Pang, it's Robert Terry, and it's Helen Robinson. Um, but I also want to mention Dominic from WHO and Harry Burden, who is the director of the Public Health Genomics Foundation in England. And we had help from three fantastic interns in WHO, Marianne, Clarissa, and Georgios. And overseeing this project, the design and analysis of the project, we have um, had a terrific scientific board. And you can see the 17 people here, and I'm sure you, some of the names are familiar to you. Um, so they are people from academia, from non-governmental organizations, and uh, also from governmental organizations. So to give you a bit of an overview first, um, so essentially we surveyed, used the Delphi type survey to survey 368 international experts in science and public health to identify these top 25 challenges. Um, like Tiki mentioned, it's an exercise. This exercise is an update to the 2002 WHO report, um, Genomics and World Health. And it's the first exercise since the decoding of the human genome in 2001 to be focused on genomics for public health in developing countries. So a bit of context. So genomics for clinical and public health care is here. Um, I'm sure people in this room are, are probably aware of that. Um, we are seeing an increasing number of genomic-based clinical and public health interventions. Um, and there was recently a great overview paper by Manolio about this, and they highlighted four particular application areas where it's sort of not long, no longer futuristic, but it's actually here. So it's tumor-based screening, it's family history, directed decision support, uh, pharmacogenomics, and diagnostic gen genome sequencing. However, what we see and have seen for the last decade, possibly the last two decades, is sort of in the background 
um, extensive media hype, I would say, sort of ten, which tends to inflate societal expectation to genomics for public health. And what we also see uh, increasingly is that some of the newer genomic interventions celebrated as cost-effective in developed country are surely out of reach uh, for many of the people living in, in developing countries. A good example is that, is uh, next-generation uh, genetic sequencing. So, by identifying genomics for public health priorities, we hope to generate awareness, focus limited resources, develop a more strategic approach, um, strengthen capacity in developing countries, and essentially shape the future in tune with global societal values, expectations, and needs. So one of the first things we did in this exercise was to try to define genomics. It sounds simple, but it turned out not to be. So remember, we had our scientific board overseeing the project, so we essentially asked each of the members of the scientific board to uh, provide us their definition of genomics. Um, we essentially ended up with or received 17 different definitions of genomics, which was very interesting. So we had to agree on sort of a cons consensus or operating definition of genomics for this exercise. So this is the one we have used for this exercise. Genomics is the study of the total or part of the genetic or epigenetic sequence information of organisms. So I've sort of provided a bit of uh, analogy here to, <laughs> to a music stereo. So you can think of sort of genetic sequence as sort of which music it's playing, which music CD are you actually putting into your stereo. The epigenetic sequence is more sort of controlling the on-off button on the stereo and also sort of the volume. Um, so genomics attempt to understand the structure and function of these sequences and of downstream biological products. Genomics in health examines the molecular mechanisms and interplay of this molecular information and health intervention and environmental factors in disease. So importantly, um, for this exercise, we consider genomics across all organisms as relevant to public health. And we also consider technologies that make use of genomics. So moving on to the methods we used. So we used this Delphi type survey of 368 international experts in science and public health. And we use two rounds to pick their brain, so to speak. In round one, um, sort of what we label as the brainstorming round, we essentially ask the um, experts, the open-ended question, what do you think are the grand challenges or bottlenecks in genomics for public health in developing countries over the next 10 years? So we received back approximately 1,500 ideas from which we distilled um, uh, 106 distinct ideas. So we took these 106 ideas into a round two, sort of the priority setting exercise, and we asked each expert to prioritize their top five of these 106 ideas. And from that, we were able to identify the top 25 challenges. So moving on to the results. So this is the printout I hope you have in front of you. Um, like I mentioned, I won't go through each challenge by itself. Um, and I should also mention that you see a number attached to each of the challenges. So this is not a ranking. So within the top 25, we haven't ranked the challenges. It's sort of more as a point of reference so we can know what we talk about. So we can say challenge one and challenge two and so forth. So a couple of general messages across the challenges um, that I just want to highlight. So there's one general message um, around strengthening healthcare systems. And what you see in the, when you look across the challenges is probably a listing of specific elements or processes within the healthcare system that need strengthening for developing countries to be able to harness genomics. Uh, but there's also a clear implication that from the challenges that sort of some of the basic ingredients are missing, which is a reflection of sort of the state of genomic sciences and sort of, of translo translational genomics that tries to take sort of basic science into health, public health applications. So what you see when you look at this diagram is that actually a lot of the challenges, they span sort of from basic science to public health application, which means sort of the concerted effort across the span uh, in the healthcare system is actually needed to, uh, to, meet, each, to meet that challenge. 
A third general message when we look across these 25 challenges is um, on the deployment of genomic interventions, um, where we see a call for genomic-based care uh, to be developed, to be deployable at point of care, which obviously many developing countries mean sort of outside central hospital facility and, and very often in very uh, resource poor uh, clinical settings or out of sort of clinical settings altogether. Uh, only four of the 25 challenges are sort of specific technology or disease specific challenges. So I've listed the four here that are in the top, five, top 25. So it's around a call for further cancer epidemiology studies to evaluate feasibility and impact of disease prevention and early detection. Um, it's development of further prenatal and neonatal early diagnostic tests for treatable diseases. It's development of low-cost diagnostic test and genetic sequencing platforms and it's a call for further characterization of infectious diseases. So, um, in our group, we also wanted to consider sort of how we can meet the top 25 challenges. So, up until now, the presentation a bit about sort of outlining what the top 25 challenges is. So, the next couple of slides, I will talk a little bit about how we think we can meet these challenges. So when we looked at the challenges identified, we identified four themes for action. Um, and when you look at these themes that I've outlined here on this slide, uh, you should see them, as, see them as complementary to each other and sort of stakeholders should retain equal value across them. So the first theme is around getting genomics on the national health agenda. Second theme is around recognizing and building on the complementarity of research and healthcare. Third theme is development of infrastructure and capacity in research and healthcare. Fourth theme is engage the public with genomics to ensure the responsible application of genomics in healthcare. So, when we look across the four themes um, uh, for action that we have identified, there's sort of an underlying premise I just want to highlight. And it is essentially um, where we encourage a move from sort of a push model to a pull model for genomics for public health. Um, so push model, where, which is basically seen the last couple of decades, is one where, which is built on enthusiasm and hope for genomics. And players in that model are primarily the researchers and the geneticists. Whereas in the pull model, um, the pool model is based on a demand from informed stakeholders for proven cost-effective genomic-based interventions. And we would like to see policymakers and public health leaders into that stage, or into that model, into the stage of genomics for public health. So I've, this slide is just highlighting some of the uh, specific recommendations we have uh, when we look across the four themes for action for how to meet the grand challenges. So firstly, benefits from genomics is unlikely to flow passively onto developing countries which means that countries, developing countries need to be proactive. And we need to see a development and strengthening of sort of translational genomics, which is trying to bridge uh, the basic science to public health. Um, secondly, countries need to work together, and both in the form of South-South and North-South collaborations. Essentially to align strategies, reduce costs, and to develop required infrastructure and capacity. And sort of, when you look at the challenges, many of them actually rings true to developed countries as well, sort of from a qualitative point of view. Uh, but developed countries, they also have an important supportive role to play uh, for the grand challenges for developing countries. And we would like to see, or we, there's a need for an evidence-based approach. Um, essentially, the relative benefits of genomics versus non-genomics interventions, they vary from disease to disease and are not constant. I mean, they're evolving all the time because sort of the basic science and, uh, and technologies are evolving all the, all the time due to new discoveries. But we need to see in, in developing countries sort of a national assessment of public health priorities first. So what is the public health burden in, in each developing country? Then we make a call for a creation of a national body in each country to work as sort of an independent assessor and broker of genomic applications. 
and we also need to make sure we have uh, an informed, informed stakeholder to get the responsible application of genomics. So this is my last slide, um, just to highlight some of the conclusions. Um, so the fundamental message is actually that expectation from the experts, these close to, from the 368 experts we have we surveyed, is that the expectation is that genomics can help meet public health burden in developing countries over the next 10 years. None of the experts came back to say there's no, nothing of value in, in, in genomics, don't even consider this. Um, and our top 25 challenges identify a set of current top priorities in developing countries to harness genomics for public health over the next 10 years. And most of the challenges in the top 25, these, they concern these sort of specific elements and processes in, in healthcare system that needs to be developed uh, to generate uh, the technology, science and capacity relevant to the needs and context of each developing country and also for countries to evaluate genomic-based interventions and adopting the most cost-effective interventions relevant to their needs and context. Okay, that was my last slide. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikkel, for outlining the, the main findings of uh, the Grand Challenges exercise. When we designed this session, we also felt that it would be useful, uh, in addition to identifying the challenges, to also see if there were examples of how countries have actually tried to apply some of these uh, recommendations. And one of the recommendations that, that Mikael highlighted was that countries need to be proactive. So the next two speakers are going to be essentially examples of that. Now, we are very honored to have uh, Dean uh, Professor Xiang Wen Chan from National Taiwan University uh, in Taipei. Now, while you probably wouldn't think of Taiwan strictly as a developing country, I used to work in, in, in WHO, and I've always felt really mainly for political reasons, as you may know, some of you, uh, Taiwan until today is not a member of the WHO. Uh, for various political reasons. And I've always felt scientifically that it was always very nice to see efforts coming out of Taiwan, especially in applying areas like, like, like genomics. So we're going to hear from, from Dean Chang about how, how they've applied some of the recommendations in the context of infectious disease. Floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Because my background is the infectious disease clinician, and also I spend uh, quite a lot of time to help the Department of Health or help public health sector in Taiwan. So today I would like to share with you about the preparedness and handling of emerging infectious disease in Taiwan. Taiwan is a small island country located in West Pacific area and uh, with a population of 23 million. In 2003, Taiwan is uh, one of the severe affected countries by SARS outbreaks. In that year, in mid-March, we have the first imported cases of SARS imported from China. You, you can see during the first months, we have no local spread of the SARS virus, and almost all the cases within the first months are all imported from other countries, mainly from China. Unfortunately, in late April, we had a patient who had fever, but she did not have travel history or any obvious contact histories. She had fever and admitted in one city hospital in Taipei. Later, she was diagnosed as a SARS patient, but before the diagnosis, she already spread the virus to many hospitalized patients and healthcare workers. And later, the, the, the virus also spread to some other hospitals. This caused the outbreak in Taiwan. During that time, actually, we have only 347 patients get infected, and among them, 37 of them die. Compared to other infectious diseases, actually, the number is not so big. But because of the severe social panic, 
This outbreak caused almost 1% of the GDP growth in that year in Taiwan. From the SARS, of course, we learned many lessons. Today, because of the time limit, I will not go through all of this. And after SARS, we took many actions in preparation for handling future emerging infectious diseases. And also, I will not go through all this, but today I will talk a little bit about the strength and liberty, capability, and capacity, and also the vaccine development. This two probably more related to today's topic. For strengthening library capability and capacity, we de developed a new technology to detect new emerging pathogens. We set up laboratory diagnosis standards for various pathogens. Also, we built library networks and improved the capability of research lab with more fundings. We also strengthened the international cooperation with labs in other countries. For vaccine development and manufacturing, the academia in Taiwan, including University and National Health Research Institute of Taiwan, helped local pharmaceutical companies to build up their ability to manufacture vaccines, including influenza vaccines. Before, in Taiwan, we have no this kind of ability to manufacture vaccine in Taiwan. And also, Taiwan government provide more funding for vaccine development. In 2009, as we all know, the new resorted novel H1N1 influenza virus appeared in Mexico. It rapidly spread to many other countries. Within two to three weeks, this virus spread to almost all over the world through traveling. In Taiwan, we have the first imported case, imported case on May 20, that year. Before that and after that, actually, we took a lot of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical intervention to prevent the virus spread. So until July 2nd, we have the first indigenous H1N1 cases in Taiwan. And also until July 30, we had the first H1N1 associated death. Because of this delay, the transmission of virus, we have enough time to uh, manufacture influenza vaccine. And so I will mention a little bit about our vaccination program. As I mentioned, because of the academic help in Taiwan, the local pharmaceutical company can manufacture H1N1 influenza vaccine. So our government can easily purchase 50 million doses of the vaccine, which cover two thirds of the population. And we launch the vaccination program on November 1st. People can get the vaccination free of charge. We also have a nationwide in-school influenza vaccine program, which bring a very high vaccination rates in the school ch children or students, including the elementary school, junior high school, and senior high school all have very high rate of vaccination. And finally, 5.5 million doses were used, which cover 24% of the total population in Taiwan. This slide shows the daily vaccination dose of H1N1 vaccine in that period. You can see from mid-November to late December, almost every day of the weekday, we use more than 150,000 doses of H1N1 vaccine. You can see there is a very high peak here. This is because we launched a national immunization day on December 12 that year. In that single day, 563 doses of H1N1 vaccine were injected to general population, 
which equal to 2.4% of the total population in Taiwan. In that time period, we also have a national policy for school class suspension. If any class have two or more cases of influenza-like illness within three days, then that class will be suspended for five days to prevent the spread of the virus. You can see from the slides, initially, we have gradually increased number of classes suspended. But after we launched the uh, school vaccination program uh, since November 16th in elementary school and later to junior high school, senior high school, we can see about two weeks later, we have dramatic decrease of the number of classes suspended. This is the number of outpatient visits with influenza line in use in different age groups. You can see the similar trends. Initially, the more and more patient, outpatient visit with influenza like illness, but after we start the, the uh, school vaccination program, then the outpatient visit with influenza like illness decreased rapidly. This is the severe cases of H1N1 influenza who needed to be hospitalized. You can see there's a similar trends. Among these severe patients, the, the red one is the patient died. Actually, there's not so many cases die of the H1N1 influenza. This slide shows the number of deaths or mortality rates per 1 million population by H1N1 infection in different countries. Here, the red one is the Taiwan. We have quite low mortality rates compared to other OECD countries. And here is the United States, and here's the United Kingdom. They all have a quite high mortality rates. In this early year, we also know there's a new resultant avian influenza H7N9 appeared in China, which caused human infection. And in April, in March and April, you can see there's uh, quite a lot of cases, human cases, uh, especially in East China. Until now, 134 cases of H7N9 human cases all are in the China. But uh, there's one case imported to Taiwan. This case was confirmed to be H7N9 on April 24 this year. This is a 53-year-old gentleman who returned to Taipei from Suzhou near the Shanghai area. He stayed in Suzhou for about uh, two weeks from March 28 to April 9 because of business. He denied any poultry or avian exposure. Three days later, three days after he came back to Taipei, he began to have mild fever and malaise. And a few days later, high fever appeared and also with the cough. He visited a local clinic and then transferred to the hospital and admitted to one hospital. In that hospital, the source swab examination showed influenza PCR was negative. However, his condition deteriorated gradually. On April 20, he was transferred to my hospital, National Taiwan University Hospital, because of respiratory failure. And the sputum examination in my hospital showed H7N9 PCR was positive. And the various cultures subsequently also show positive results. This shows his serious change of the chest x-rays. From the lab upper, you can see initially there's no any pneumonic lesion. Later, a pneumonia lesion appear gradually. Up to April 20, his condition deteriorated rapidly. Even on ventilator, still cannot maintain his oxygenation. So he was put on ECMO on April 22. And the condition remains still very poor. The virus isolation from these patients 
uh, we do the whole genome uh, sequence and the phylogenetic analysis, of course, show the, the gene sequence basically is the same as those isolates from China. However, there are some important uh, mutations different from the isolate from China, and that cause uh, amino acid substitution uh, have some difference. Difference, for example, the neuraminidase, the amino acid two ninety two position, we have the mutation which results in uh, antiviral agent of the Tamivir that's Tamiflu resistant. Also in the hemagglutinin uh, region, some amino acid change, and this may increase the binding affinity of the human upper airway epithelial cells. This is just some example. And we also serious follow the viral title in his tibetan so swap and nasopharyngeal swap. And also we serious check his serum antibody. And from uh, May 1st, his serum antibody became in elevated, and then the virus rapidly uh, disappeared. We also checked the serum cytokine level. We found there are very high uh, cytokine level in several different cytokines. With all these information, we treat this patient initially with high dose of the Tamiflu, that's Tamiflu. However, because of the Tamiflu is resistant, then we shift to another antiviral agent with intravenous injection. We also gave the patient anti-IL-6 antibody to treat the cytokine storm, and gave the steroids to treat his acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. But only after the virus was undetectable, we started the uh, steroid treatment. This is the uh, follow up of the chest x ray. You can see his condition gradually improved. And before discharge, his chest almost all are cleared. In summary, the successful handling of H1, N1, H7, and 9 influenza in Taiwan is based on long-standing national preparedness efforts for pandemic influenza. The H7, N9 case in Taiwan give us an important lesson that strong laboratory capability may help correct diagnosis and understanding the characteristic of the pathogen, which may help us to determine how to treat the patients. Genomic studies of the new emerging pathogen and host response may help us to understand the pathogenesis more and probably may bring some new treatment regimens. Thank you for your attention. I th uh, thank you, Dean Chang, for I think what is a marvelous illustration of the importance of some of the key techniques derived from genomics, such as genomic sequencing, uh, PCR, uh, for detection of, of, of pathogen sequences to allow the right public health measures, like you know, closure of schools, even the treatment of individual patients, and importantly, as Mikel also mentioned, to better actually characterize the pathogenesis of the disease itself. So from a, a public sector example of infectious disease, we now move on to see how some of these challenges have been applied in the private sector in the context of uh, development of inter interventions that could be of public health importance, especially in the context of the emerging burden of, 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 of chronic diseases. And from what I sometimes refer to as uh, Taiwan being an orphan country in the context of being left out of WHO for many, many years. We moved to, to a truly developing country, which is actually my home. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Raymond Chandraminata to speak about the Indonesian experience to try and perhaps address some of these uh, grand challenges in the context of countries needing to be proactive.
First, I would like to thank the organizing committee in this, uh, Dr. Tiki Pang, who suggested me to bring this uh, actual topic to come into uh, public context, and its in information, and the presentation today. So what I'm going to speak about is our experience in Indonesia as a private sector. Dexa Medica is a pharmaceutical company, is one of the leading pharmaceutical company in ASEAN. What we've done here is actually using the genomic, uh, genomics, proteomics, uh, but today I'll be talking about more of the genomics in the context of discovery of herbal bioactive fractions. Yeah. So to begin with, let us uh, remind ourselves uh, the Human Genome Project was, uh, uh, was sequenced, was finished, and published in 2001. It brought a lot of attention and brought a lot of excitement on what we can be do, what we can do with the human genome uh, sequence, uh, in particular in uh, the application of it to biology, to health, in particular to the health is a development of pharmaceuticals that can be brought uh, by having much more targets, newer targets to human drugs as well as the genomics, the implication of genomics to society in which uh, previous speakers have talked about. Yeah. So this particular uh, excitement, um, if you look into, and it, it turned out to be uh, grand challenges, 25 grand challenges that's been uh, published in the WHO newsletter, especially what I'm going to be talking about number six, uh, translational research, as well as more on the uh, national national programs that ensure access to validated low-cost genomic tests and care, and in terms, in this case, is intervention in the uh, result of the genomic science. Now, let me brought you into attention that there is a paper in 2006. Uh, it says that because of the advance of the human genome sequence, there are more and more target proteins for drugs that's been discovered. Many of these are not actually being uh, met into real or validated target, but yet as we have more targets, supposedly we have more drugs because uh, many of these older drugs do not meet the current uh, clinical practice needs. So with the new targets that's been generated by the genomics that has been uh, sequenced, at least in the human genome, uh, brought us a lot of excitement that now, wow, we have a lot of target proteins that previously has not been recognized as target proteins for new drugs. But as we go, this is, a, I, I take it from New York Times, June 14, 2010. It says, where is the payoff? Even though we have all these uh, genome sequence already been discovered, but yet there's not many pr uh, products, there, there, there many drugs comes to the market. Especially if you look into the, uh, this is data that came from the US FDA. The number of the drug, it's chemical, which is small molecules, the average spot, it's, in this case, in 2006, was below 20. Now the, uh, the number is going better, that 25, but uh, luckily we have the biological proteins that make up the numbers going up higher, the average about 25. Yeah. So we see here there's a possibility that maybe we can do something about the uh, bio uh, fraction from the natural products. Now, our country, Indonesia, has plenty of natural products. We have about 7,500 7, uh, plant species that can be made into drugs, basically. Then uh, traditionally been used by the different ethnic groups in, all over Indonesia. Um, we have about 13,000 islands. Those 7,500 7, species lives in, actually there are habitat of different islands of Indonesia. But what we can do is actually, what about uh, uh, if we use the genomic technology to screen all these, uh, these species of the plants that's been discovered in many parts of Indonesia? So that's what we do. Uh, prior to that is actually what we need to be bring is we, make, we have to make bioactive fraction. So let me remind you a little bit that there is uh, in the uh, sequence of what the bioactive fraction versus extract, you can see here one can have simplicia, which is actually the, uh, the dried out of the plant material, or you can make an extract, or you can fractionate those extract. And then if you screen it toward molecular screening, this is where the genomics into place. Because we use the genomic technology to screen all the plant materials using the target that's been used and validated in the US FDA NIH uh, uh, program uh, that we can get it from the internet. Now, if we have this bioactive fraction, then obviously we will have to follow on using uh, the molecular pharmacological techniques as well as the modern pharmacology using the toxicology as well as the uh, clinical uh, studies, uh, phase one, two, and three, and so on. So this, if you can see here on this uh, particular sequence, bioactive fractions is actually one step prior to a compound. 
So if you remember, aspirin, uh, Dr. John Wong this morning talking about the, the greatest invention from Germany, that's coming from a plant called Salix alba here. And also oseltamivir, that's another, another great natural product. So it's paclitaxel and so on. So what we do here is actually mimicking what we have done, what, what has been done in the, in the past uh, in the Western European countries or even North America, but we use a, a local plant using genomic technology. Now this is a difference between extract versus bioactive fraction. You can see here in extract, it's very, very dirty. There's so many uh, compounds that's been still on the, uh, at the average, there, there are probably about 900 to 1,000 compounds is still within the uh, extract. But when you make a fraction, you make a derivatives of the extract, then you will have, you end up with only five or 10 uh, principal compounds. And in fact, you can increase these. For example, this, uh, this particular compound, you can signify increasing the uh, signal uh, of this, uh, and, and also the amounts of this particular uh, compound uh, using fraction. So we use this approach uh, to screen out the, uh, the genes using PCR-based assay, or sometimes we use proteomic approach using the uh, 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 SEAS page and protein uh, technology. Now, the bioactive component, as you can see, even if when you eat something, you eat some vegetables, they will have, in a certain uh, physiological range of concentration, they will have impact on not only on this, um, this is obviously this is a central dogma of molecular biology. From DNA, you can make mRNA or you can make protein. But all of these sequence of biochemical reactions, they can be influenced by the bioactive compounds. Now, if you remember, because, uh, when you have a disease, pathological changes happening to the expression of the genes being up and down, then you can use the bioactive fraction, bioactive components, you can either downregulate or upregulate certain genes that's associated with that particular disease. So essentially what we can do is actually we can signify, uh, signify de by de detecting the amount of mRNA or the amount of protein as a result of adding the bioactive components. And that way you can screen out the different uh, uh, plants materials towards certain uh, diseases. For example, if you're looking into a, a, a disease like a non communicable disease like diabetes, for example, you will have to find the uh, gene target for the uh, diabetes. There, it's polygenic gene, but many of the uh, investigators are using, for example, PPAR gamma, GLUT4, and so on. Uh, we can use that as a PCR assay, or even at the protein levels, we can in see we can see whether it's up or down with the uh, bioactive co uh, compounds. Yeah. So that's what essentially what, what we do in, in our screening programs. And in fact, uh, this is again, this is summarizes what we've done. Uh, using the data-based uh, gene, uh, genomic, and then we identify protein targets, and we make bioactive fraction. We screen those bi bioactive fractions against the PCR or, or cell-based assay, and then you optimize it with the specific fraction, and then you do safety study as well as efficacy study in animal as well as human. In that case, so this is again another summary. Uh, we use chemical informatics because in, within a particular extract or a, a particular bioactive fraction, there's so many compounds, so many uh, bio secondary met metabolites. Well, whether it's alkaloids, uh, it could be uh, turpentines and so on. But uh, by fishing it with chemical informatics information to begin with, followed by fractionation, and we can have much more better hit uh, than if you have not done the chemical informatics. Chemi informatics. Uh, the idea here is after we made the specific uh, components, uh, extract and fraction, you have to standardize those because otherwise you will be uh, futile in developing that bioactive fraction. And then from that, we do the bioactive, uh, we do bioassay, we do bioassay using specific gene targets. And then after the, 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 re the resulting bioactive fractions to undergo clinical trials with one, two, and three. And then you can have such a product become a medicine or a nutrition or even a product of biotechnology. Yeah. So this is an example of what we have done. Uh, I, I take only one example, and this has been done uh, at least a phase one clinical trial. This is a bioactive fraction from a, a basically cinnamon burmani, which you know it's, it's sometimes you spread it on the bread. But when you make specific bioactive fraction of it, what we call the LBS 2411, and then um, we already screen it against PPI, proton pump inhibitor, as well as certain uh, mucus, muc5 gene, and so on. There are, there are about five gene targets uh, that we screen. It turned out that if you do a clinical trial, if this is a phase one trial with 17 patients. This is actually as similar, as good as, even a little bit better than omega.
omeprazole in terms of increasing the intergrastic pH uh, beyond four. Uh, this is an example how a natural product that if you do uh, genomic-based bioactive screening, it is not uh, less uh, in, in efficacy compared to uh, 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 chemical-based products. Yeah. Now, we have done uh, quite a bit of experiments. It's an example. We have a few that's already been on the market, at least in Indonesia. That one, Redacid, is a 2411 for uh, uh, GERD. Now we are doing clinical trials for GERD. Inlacin is for diabetes. Dissolve is uh, from the uh, earthworm. Dismano, this is for OBGYN products for endometriosis as well as premenstrual syndrome. But these are all the result of what we have done, uh, application of genomics technology, uh, looking into the, uh, the difference by active fraction. And this is, uh, she is our Minister of Health uh, because obviously the bioactive fraction, we have to manufacture in our factory because we, need, we have the know-how also is protected by intellectual property. But this is the first time that uh, the Indonesian government gave the recognition to a local industry that uh, has developed the first bioactive fraction manufacturing facility in Indonesia. And it was in, inaugurated in the 20th of August uh, this year. By, uh, uh, by the Minister of Health. Yeah. Now, what is future? I think the, field, the whole field of pharmacogenomic, and most particularly when we come to a, a field of bioactive fraction, is nutrigenomics. Yeah? Um, we, have to, we have to do a lot of things on this because every single product, every single herbal that's come into bioactive fraction will have a different ways to different ethnic group, even in Indonesia, because uh, Indonesia is very, very wide in terms of the islands, but also ethnic groups. The, the country was divided by the Wallace line to the east and to the, to the west, and obviously all this bioactive fraction will have certainly uh, affect the genes of these patients, uh, the, of, of the environments. So. Uh, we are actually looking into the differences in the future. Um, what is the effect of single bioactive fraction to certain ethnic groups in Indonesia? And hopefully we can have a more personalized which fraction is actually more active towards certain ethnic group in Indonesia. Yeah. So that is a future works. Um, um, that will conclude my discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raymond, for I think a, a, a potentially very important example of how uh, you know in the, in this case a private sector within a developing country has actually been very proactive in, you, in applying these kind of technologies in, in in very important areas. I'd like now to to hand over the chairing of the session to my uh, ex colleague from WHO, Rob Terry. Thank you, Tiki. Uh, we just have two more speakers now, and uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Helen Robinson, who uh, is from the University of Melbourne, uh, but also does a lot of policy and uh, strategy work with the Human Variome Project. So they've been one of the partners that uh, we've been working with in, in this Grand Challenges work. So I'll pass over to you, Helen. To put it in a, in a bit of context, you know, we've identified the challenges, we've seen some, some applications Big question is what next? So hopefully we'll try and address that. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, I'll start again. So my name is uh, Helen Robinson and I'm based at the NOSL, Institute for Global Health, which is in the medical faculty at the University of Melbourne. But I'm going to talk about some research I undertook, which was funded by the Human Variome Project. And um, I'll say a little bit about who they are um, at the end. But essentially, trying to look at um, some of and the Human Variome Project, um, many of our members were um, active participants in the global challenges um, that Mikhail outlined. And many members also were on the technical panel um, of, of that particular project. 
So um, I'll talk about, just to very briefly try to draw together a range of pieces of research that have undertaken trying to map out um, what's happening in human genetics and genomics, uh, particularly in um, developing countries, but the links between both developed and developing countries. And essentially what we're interested in is trying to move to the right, uh, understanding how we m move from um, an environment which is essentially funded through ministries of science and technology, research projects at the left-hand side of this um, framework, and I need to acknowledge Eric Green from NIH in the US uh, for coming up with this typology. But um, as the human genome has developed, we're understanding the structure of the genome, understanding the biology of the genome, and understanding the biology of disease. But what we're trying to do is to translate these innovations into how we understand and advance the science of medicine, and more importantly, um, for those of you who attended the, the opening speeches this morning, this idea of how we move these developments into, as quickly as possible, into the effectiveness of health care and translating them into improved health outcomes for populations. And so essentially what I'm going to talk about is how we, uh, if you want to move to the right in this typology, how do you do it and uh, what are the challenges um, and how this underpins some of the things that came out in the grand challenges for genomics, genetics and um, uh, public health in the developing world. So essentially what we did was um, to survey a whole range of people who are working in this sector in um, many different countries of the world. We also uh, got to these people through um, various national human genomics and genetic societies. And we're trying to understand what are these activities. I, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, perhaps if people have questions, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about the, it's a fairly standard social science methodology. Essentially what we found in trying to work out what is happening in developed and developing countries, we found that there is quite a lot of activity in various parts of genetics and genomics um, in about 50 or so countries. But the most important thing is that it's accelerating extremely quickly. The number of countries is expanding and the nature of activity in each country is also increasing. However, we found that it was extremely fragmented both within countries and between countries. There's very little da systemic data collection of what actually is going on in a range of quite expensively funded research projects. And the reporting that takes place is relatively um, within uh, quite a, a small neighborhood. There are a lot of one-off reviews. There are a, a large number of publications. But not a lot of this is done in a systemic way and monitored in a way um, that allows us to reflect on this experience or try to coordinate the collaboration. It's very much a kind of a research project mindset rather than a health system improvement progr programmatic mindset. And one of the most important found, uh, findings, particularly for the World Health Summit, is that very, very weak links with the ministries of health, health service delivery, and with policy makers as such. So why is this so, and how does this kind of typology map out? So we're very interested to understand what are the interests in genomics and public health, and how do you actually make this transition um, to, to service delivery? That um, you need to improve the provision, and we've just seen some of the examples um, in, in two countries where this is taking place. But also when it comes to understanding um, service delivery, uh, this kind of idea about how these developments impact on diagnosis, the kind of counselling that is needed and the treatment implications of that. Who pays for these treatments? Um, what are the out-of-pocket out of expenditures? We're very interested in how they're covered in um, health, health insurance systems, who pays for the diagnosis, who pays for the treatment and uh, the diagnostic services, and what access do the poor in these countries have to these systems. And these, of course, are very important for planning future services. Will it be possible to deliver health services with the current mix of skills and competency that exist not only in developed countries but also in developed
developing countries and do we have enough skilled people um, to deliver on the promise of this health um, delivery. And of course understanding what some people are describing as the digital divide that we've seen in other areas of um, technological development where some countries are um, uh, exploding in this time of research and whether that is in fact the case in low and middle income countries. We were very interested in um, mapping all of this out, these issues, because we'd like to see some kind of international program on human genetics and genomics and public health. And we were very interested in finding out from research scientists and clinical practitioners uh, whether they thought there should be some form of global program, and if so, um, what would it look like and what might be the priorities. So in the interviews and consultations we, we conducted um, in the last uh, 18 months or so, we were trying to establish a case for uh, establishment of a global program that could promote um, these um, kind of developments into health service delivery and that could address the issues of um, promoting global so uh, solidarity, look for issues of effectiveness and efficiency um, uh, and focusing on the disease burden in uh, different patterns of disease burden in different countries and different regions of the world. Also trying to find um, mechanisms for improving the efficiency and cost effectiveness for health um, service delivery and um, forming some kind of um, development of an, a sound evidence base um, in this um, rather but new field. So rather than just focus on a whole list of issues, let me move rather quickly to four main issues that we found in the interviews and the consultations that we did that essentially there were four different clusters of issues that came out um, universally across um, uh, both developed and developing countries. And these form very much uh, and are consistent with what Mikkel was talking about in the Grand Challenges um, study undertaken uh, with um, the World Health Organization. So really, this movement to the right to um, promote more innovative ways of um, delivering various health services is um, really partly uh, looking at the uncertainties and the predictions in the outcomes of genomic medicine, that it's a very early field, it's, it's in its infancies. But at the same time, these services um, and what we've learned in the past, innovations need to very much look at fair access to services, whether it's in developed or developing countries, and assess the effectiveness of those services and understand how the genomic knowledge is going to be used for the conceptualising of health, disease and illness. And because we're finding, and we saw hints of this in the previous two um, presentations, that we're fast forming um, a rethinking about how we um, uh, conceptualise not only diseases and the genomic underpinning of some diseases is starting to be rewritten, but also how we conceptualise illness. The second issue that came out very strongly was how to in, uh, integrate these genomic services into various kinds of health service delivery. How um, information and knowledge about disparities in different parts of the world, looking at different um, ethnic populations, uh, have a lot to tell us uh, as we have a better understanding of the migration of certain policy, uh, populations across the world is altering the way we look at um, many different kinds, kinds of diseases. Also the way cultural and social activities, who marries who, um, various kinds of um, uh, consanguinity and these kinds of issues uh, around reproduction. The very important notion of how to find solutions in, uh, that are relevant to low income settings, this fast medicalization, very um, dominant medical models that we're seeing in health system delivery around genomics and genetics in the developed countries um, is certainly not appropriate for low income settings. And trying to find some way of particularly capacity building and knowledge, knowledge sharing between countries. Um, and uh, how we can use that kind of knowledge sharing. Very importantly, that knowledge becomes a, an important resource um, in this kind of development. Thirdly, um, 
the understanding that how you can leverage the diversity that there is in different parts of the world. As I was talking a moment ago about migration of different populations, to learn from that, particularly from uh, rare disease, but at the same time um, protecting vulnerable populations from um, various kinds of stigma that can be related um, to uh, genomic and genetic um, labelling. Also, how we identify high-risk populations and the families and the communities that they come from. But understanding what we've learned in the past from health service innovation is that if you can come up with um, mechanisms for leveraging that diversity, there is with, uh, across the world, we come up with not only um, cheaper outcomes, but better quality outcomes if uh, this kind of d diversity is embraced early on. Fourthly, um, an issue that was on the minds of a lot of the people with whom we consulted was the um, implications um, of having to update, uh, and this is a theme for this particular health, um, health summit this year, is how we um, update the curricula of various um, um, medical and health related um, uh, training programs, not only uh, undergraduate and postgraduate, but continuing in education programs. And our um, colleagues in the American College for um, Genetics and Genomics did a survey recently among US um, clinical physicians and found that less than 10% of them feel comfortable with their level of knowledge of um, human genomics and genetics. And if that's the case in uh, 2011, um, it's only going to get worse, um, and how do we prepare health workers of various kinds, um, not only um, genetics um, uh, physicians and so on. It's a, going to be a very, very big issue um, uh, in the future. So putting together the various kinds of research that um, I undertook uh, for the Human Varion Project um, is building a picture of a very fragmented, um, fragmented world, something where there is uh, a lot of growth, a lot of interest. Um, there are a lot of people undertaking um, small, uh, not so small projects in various parts of the world. There's a lot of expertise, um, energy, and importantly, enthusiasm. And some resources have been invested uh, by cer uh, certain funders of research, but not um, more towards the, if you remember that graph I showed at the left-hand side and the molecular um, uh, research side, very little into research into how these kinds of innovations can be introduced into health systems, into clinical practice, and how it might impact on the delivery of primary health care. So what we've learned um, and the kinds of things that we stress are around the need to bring people together, both from the molecular research end as well as from clinical pra uh, practice, diagnosticians in laboratories, people who conduct various kinds of testing, who do the genome-wide sectors, the exome-wide sectors, and collecting that kind of information. We also need to facilitate their coordination and to kind of give permission to uh, the sharing of this knowledge in a more systematic way. And the most important thing that I, that I want to stress in this presentation is the very, very weak links there are to ministries of health. And even in my country, like Australia, it's very, very difficult to find a health bureaucrat that has any understanding of genomics and genetics, uh, that you can engage in a policy debate and understand the implications that this kind of research will have. Um, uh, and so if, if we find these difficulties in the United States, in the UK, Canada, um, Australia, how difficult it is going to be in um, middle income countries. And this very, with this very weak emphasis on um, how to translate these innovative services into um, health systems. So kind of summarising that um, what we've found in this research is that um, there, there is a need to focus on the adequacy and the quality and effectiveness of what is possible in delivering health services in both developed and developing countries. And we've had some insight into the research that we've done into uh, um, revealing some of the barriers and trying to create some of the incentives that are needed. But the importance of acting responsibly uh, in the sense of protecting people's rights. Um, HVP is um, an NGO with uh, operation status with um, UNESCO, and we ensure that all the work that's conducted um, in uh, the countries that are affiliated with HVP is done um, 
consistently with the various international declarations hosted by UNESCO around um, sharing of human genomic data. We're also very interested in setting standards so that the whole research world um, speaks a similar language, dry, um, describes mutations, variations in the genome, uh, gene sites and so on in a consistent vocabulary, which they don't do today. And with this important of, importance of setting standards, particularly of clinical practice, that relates not only to the naming and the nomenclature um, around these kinds of things. And the most, I guess, important thing is that there needs to be some kind of a place where you can legitimately debate um, these issues, both regionally and internationally, with an attempt to try and bring the people together um, to resolve these issues. But I guess the good news um, that we've found also um, is through HVP, as I said, who's a, um, a non-government organisation dedicated to the international coordination and sharing of genomic variation data, and making sure that, um, that um, this variation data is, con uh, is collected within national legislative framework uh, and links to clinical practice. That, um, that this is actually happening and we have members in all regions of the world um, and people who are carrying out this kind of research, clinicians who are using um, genomic and genetic data uh, in day-to-day -day, um, clinical practice. HVP has 21 um, formally in constituted what we call country nodes already, and there are about another 28 or 30 countries of the world, both um, developed countries as well as low and middle income countries that are setting up repositories for the storing and collecting of um, genomic data. And um, we also have um, not only uh, these countries who are working with us, but also a whole series of international um, genetic gene and disease databases that collect together, as I was saying before, um, the people who are doing the research with the diagnostic uh, laboratories and um, people who are un un using this work um, for clinical practice. And this is very important for, uh, I guess, again, one of the themes and looking at some of the um, presentations later on today, this notion of big data, how you keep um, and store um, a lot of these big data sets that are necessary for doing this kind of work, how you underpin the phenotype um, and the expression of the disease and link that back um, to variations that are being stored through the new, new, new generation of testing. So as I say, there are many, many people around the world who are seeking to collaborate um, and to embrace the, the grand challenges um, that we've um, described through the WHO study. And, um, but without some of the kinds of things that our research is showing, it will remain, um, well, it, it needs to be coordinated. Um, so I'll just leave it at that and maybe we'll have some questions um, at the end of the session. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Helen. So in the final talk, uh, we're very lucky that we're going to hear from uh, Professor Yunga uh, uh, Yusufong, who um, is uh, from Thailand at the National Center there for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, but also previously uh, within the Ministry of Science uh, in Thailand. So from that perspective as well, um, we will hear him uh, react to, to what we've heard now and uh, summarize a little bit uh, the implications uh, for uh, genomics as we move forward. Coming at the tail end of the session, I will try to use the limited time to, to wrap up the main points that have gone on and really to draw from the earlier presentations to see the relevance of their presentations to the big issues uh, that we see in the grand challenges in genomics and health. Dr. Oestergaard has drawn attention to the fact that the uh, Delphi survey of various experts have uh, been concentrated to specific uh, issues, 25 grand challenges were identified, and these can be 
divided into specific issues into gen in genomics for health, three main issues. One is understand uh, the genomes. Two, advancing medicine, and three, improving health care. And they can be grouped in broad topics, four topics that uh, uh, should be uh, looked at. One is genomics and society, and then the next one, scientific infrastructure, technology development, and training and education. Now, you have before you the 25 grand challenges uh, arranged as a matrix. So on one side, on, on the uh, one axis, is the three major issues of understanding uh, the genomes, genomic science, and then advancing it in medicine, and then thirdly, improving healthcare for the public in general. And the four issues that uh, I just talked about. So I've just arranged this into a kind of a Venn diagram where we can see that there are overlaps between these various issues of understanding and advancing medicine and improving health care. And it turns out that most of the issues really involve all the three aspects. So 16, 16 challenges involve all three aspects. So I think this is uh, very good and very telling that we really have to look at the uh, broad side of issues. Uh, there are three issues that concern the uh, advancing of medicine uh, from understanding genomes, and six issues that really from advancing medicine it has implication with, uh, on improving health care. So I think uh, this is one way of trying to understand the relationship between these various uh, issues in the Grand Challenges. Um, I think uh, broadly we can say that on the left-hand side, uh, in, in trying to use the knowledge about genomes to advance medicine, really is really for individuals, uh, really for the trees in the forest. I just came from another room. For the trees in the forest. Whereas on the right-hand side, on the uh, uh, implications of understanding genomes, in improving healthcare in general, is really to look at the whole forests. So it's really f for the benefit of the public in general. So I think this is, uh, and, and of course in the middle, it's for both individuals and the public. From my point of view, and I think you will agree with me that if we can move the issues, especially in the developing countries, which do not have uh, much resources, then if we look at the public more than the individuals who can take care of themselves, especially the, uh, the individuals who can afford the, the costs, um, we might try to move, in terms of public policy, try to move the uh, uh, circle on understanding genomes to overlap more with the part for the public. That is to try to have more linkage with improving public health care. It doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't try to advance the knowledge of genomes for individuals, but we expect that this will be done also from developed countries as well. Uh, the Ostergaard paper also uh, identified four emerging pillars which will need to be built. One is really getting the genomes, uh, genomics on the strategic policy agenda, the broad agenda uh, in health. Secondly, recognize and build the infrastructure you know, uh, of uh, research and uh, integration with healthcare. Uh, uh, that's thirdly, sorry. Secondly is to recognize and see that it's, uh, uh, there is relation, uh, the overlap between research and healthcare, and the thirdly is to, to develop the infrastructure for that. And fourth is to engage the public with genomics to ensure responsible application. Uh, I see this more or less as a kind of a shared you know, uh, differences. In the, the first couple of agenda of the pillars are more technical in nature, whereas the 
the, the third and fourth item is more of an advocacy uh, uh, function. We need to have the advocacy function in order to be able to persuade the public and uh, public policy makers to, to see uh, as we see. Now, fortunately, we had the uh, regional meeting in Singapore a few months ago, the World Health Summit regional meeting on the subject of stratified medicine. And uh, there are a few uh, conclusions from that meeting that uh, is very relevant to, to this uh, uh, session here. One is that uh, for the public in, in particular, uh, genomic information can be stratified, especially with the help of, of IT and other sciences, so as to benefit groups, benefit the public, as well as individuals. So this is a very important message from Singapore. And uh, uh, green is a good message. Red is a message that we should be uh, careful about. And it is that there is dilemma for developing countries, which are lagging behind in both genomics and IT. So uh, another set of uh, messages from the Singapore meeting is that, of course, uh, genomics, uh, especially in stratified medicine, gives you the right prevention or potentially the right prevention, right intervention, right therapy, and uh, the right patient at the right time, but is it at the right cost? Because there is rising cost of health innovation, which is uh, the uh, uh, participants, uh, one of the participants uh, said that it's very uh, interesting that there is rising cost in health innovation, whereas there is decreasing cost in IT at the same time, as we can see you know, uh, uh, all around us. And another question is, is there right management? Because there is now a tidal wave of data. What are, is the relevance of these data? How do we integrate them? How, what is the governance issues? So there is a uh, need for global networking. So uh, I would like to uh, now draw implications of the recommendations from the Erstergaard report. Recommendation number one on getting genomics on the strategic agenda, uh, national body of experts as, as assessor and broker of genomic applications uh, should be formed to recommend policy and legal framework. My critique is that this is very good, but we do need balanced development between personalized individual and the stratified aspects of genomic medicine. So strategic agenda is needed for such a balanced development. Recommendation number two, to recognize and build on the complementarity of research and healthcare. Uh, I think basic clinical research and practice should be much more closely integrated. This is the recommendation. Clinical translation should be complemented by population health approach. Uh, uh, my critique is that such critical issues should include the study of needs and implications of costs, benefits, especially for the public. This is very crucial for developing countries which have such limited resources. Recommendation number three, development of infrastructure and capacity in healthcare and research. An international program should be thought about, and Helen has just uh, talked about the possibility of such international program. My critique is that the relevance of such programs to real problems and feasibility of success based on limitations in developing countries should really be studied very hard. And the last recommendation is to engage the public with genomics to ensure responsible application of evidence in healthcare. Uh, and I think this is very good, and this report also says that we need to understand critical issues, uh, regulatory, ethical, legal, and social issues. So this is a very important part of the recommendation that I would like to uh, go back um, to uh, the uh, various issues that uh, would be involved. Um, I think the various issues really uh, Folk is focused on the division between personalized and stratified medicine. Personalized and stratified information responds to drugs, immunity, pathogens. So this is uh, very important, and genomics is needed for 
both of these. Uh, so that uh, for drugs, for example, uh, as Raymond has just told us, that uh, uh, genomics is potentially very important to get new drugs, more opportunities. But there are questions about costs for development and production, and the time for development, fast pace of technology, and uncertain markets. So uh, uh, all the good wishes to you, Raymond. Uh, it's very unclear right now. Implications for healthcare delivery, of course, we would have better diagnosis, treatment and prognosis, more informed choice, less risk liability, but adoption would be slow due to the complexity of technology and the higher cost of healthcare and the fast pace of technology would be factors that really deter the developing countries uh, from going into this. And implications for the public in developing countries is that both stratified and personalized healthcare needs, leads to better prevention, treatment and outcome, of course, self-care through behavior and lifestyle modification, very good, but the complexity will hinder public awareness and the high cost of healthcare and insurance, privacy of genomic and health data would be issues that would need really uh, a careful consideration. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, implications for public health of developing countries is that we need infrastructure and human resources. Uh, adopting genomics into our healthcare delivery uh, policy would put strain on limited resources. There would be complications from fast changing public health picture in our countries. Uh, there would be difficulty in maintaining, equi maintaining equity of health services difficulty in assessing optimal technologies, and most important of all, public understanding is needed. So the possible course of actions include the following. We should study the potentials and limitations of both uh, the personalized and stratified genomic medicine uh, with respect to the benefits and risks, assess the overall effects on the public health policy, including universal health coverage, assess the cost effectiveness of the technologies and practice, and uh, consider ethical, social, and legal issues which, concern, which would include informed choice of use, equity of access, privacy, and very important issues of stigmatization and discrimination. For example, jet, uh, genomic information would have implications for jobs, for insurance, how do we prevent stigmatization and discrimination? And of course, issues on intellectual properties and various regulations that would be need, need, needed. And um, we should increase the importance of policy research because there's such a lot of things that we don't know and plan for changes in healthcare practice, monitoring, education, training, and budgeting, etc. And uh, create policy for indigenous development of cost-effective genomic medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that was a, an excellent summary and also uh, setting us up, I hope, uh, nicely for um, some questions. So we, we do have uh, about 15 minutes or more um, for, to finish up the session. So if uh, I can ask people to indicate if they have a question for the panel and maybe just introduce themselves and uh, say where they're from. Okay, since no one is asking, I'm, I'm going to put Rob in a bit of a spot here. Uh, since I'm no longer working for the WHO, can you uh, maybe share with us what might the organization be doing in the future as a result of this initiative? Uh, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I think uh, what we've heard is a lot of issues, and to be honest, um, I think you can apply these to genomics, but quite a number of these would apply to, to many, many um, new technologies as they impact on, uh, on health systems. And then if we start looking at low-resource countries, we know, you know weak, weak health systems and health systems that are perhaps the least able to adapt to change. But uh, um, post-reform, WHO, for those of you who don't know, has been undergoing quite a significant restructuring and, and reform. And uh, out of that is we are looking very much at a, a, um, a health system strengthening department. 
Can we finish at 6.15? That's OK, I've still got five minutes. Uh, so we're creating a new department which is looking at how these new uh, or, uh, innovations and technologies impact on health systems and very much uh, with a view towards the, the sort of right-hand side of the model that uh, Helen uh, was introducing. And I think it's, again, we heard in the, in the, the last summary around there's a real need for some policy research uh, in this area. So um, the next steps are that uh, a new department, uh, the final name hasn't really been decided yet, but it, it'll be called Service Delivery Strengthening, or that'll be its function, and it'll try to be bringing together those uh, technologies which are, are sort of new to, to health services, so a lot of the e-health and m-health, uh, electronic, the use of electronic patient records, how all of this impacts on patient safety, and particularly how genomics could then be moved and, and as we heard, integrated uh, into health systems. So I think a lot of what we've heard today, both the work of HVP and uh, the work that we were able to uncover uh, with this study, I think will very much um, inform, inform us as we, we move forward in, with that. Okay, um, we are supposed to finish actually at, at 4.15, and I think people are coming in for the next session. So if there are no uh, further questions, uh, would you please join me in thanking all the speakers for today's session. Thank you very much. <laughs>